I am excited to welcome our second speaker, Helen Wu, who joins us or joins me from San Francisco. A little bit about Helen. Welcome, Helen. And Thanks. A little bit about you. So Helen completed a Bachelor of Law and Bachelor of Commerce at the University of New South Wales and her Masters of Law at the University of Sydney. She started her early career as an associate for Justice Carolyn Simpson in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, moving across to private practice as a commercial and litigation lawyer with DLI, DLA Piper in Sydney for four years. She then moved to work at in-house legal teams, including iCorp and Orbitz Asia Pacific, before she moved abroad to the US around 2014, where she worked with JetBlue Airways as their commercial IP and advertising council team based in New York City for three and a half years. She has been since with PlayStation from mid-2018 as their director Business and Legal Affairs Marketing and Advertising Council, based in San Francisco. Helen is a member of the State Bar of New York and registered in-house counsel of California, USA. Her areas of exp expertise are diverse and many and include commercial co transactions, complex intellect intellectual property strategy advice, global trademark portfolio management and protection, privacy and data protection, technology and software contracts, social media, marketing and advertising law, online content, advising on platforms, terms and conditions, promotional and advertising copy, risk management. That's a lot. <laughs> you must be so busy, Helen. <laughs> well, I'm going to so, start with really important that's why it's really important to keep your LinkedIn profile up to date because a lot of that was from there it's going back going back to the early stages of your career as well yeah all right um so so Helen just first question perhaps if you can just give us a an overview of your career and just maybe tell us about a couple of your your Sure, happy to do that. So uh, just to add a bit more uh, information to the introduction you provided, for me, I enjoyed uh, my school and university years here, but I have always wanted to move overseas. And I don't know if it's because I've always loved to travel as an individual or with my family or with friends, but um, when I started university, I knew that I would go and work overseas at some point. Um, so I, well, I did what I think a lot of Australians do or did do, um, which is when I finished law school, um, after I did that combined bachelor's and uh, commerce degree, um, I spent two years in London. So that was the first thing. I um, was not actually in a rush to join, um, start working really at a law firm or anywhere else. So I went off to London and, and got that out of my system. What I did when I was in London, I hadn't yet um, completed the College of Law or gotten my practicing certificate. So I did a number of paralegal roles. Um, I worked at some in-house companies, including Xerox UK, the London Borough of Enfield Council. Um, they were all in paralegal type roles, um, which was a great introduction to in-house activity. Then I moved back to Sydney and I actually applied for and started my um, work as a tip staff or associate to Justice Simpson. Um, and I looked for that role because I was really interested in seeing that perspective from the other side of the bench. Um, it's one of those few times, I think, as a young lawyer between starting work at a firm or starting anywhere that you can actually work with a judge. And that was hugely beneficial to get to see um, what it's like inside a judge's chambers, um, working on research, drafting, reviewing judgments, um, and just speaking even to judges and barristers and getting exposure to all of that. Um, so I really enjoyed that first, the, the year or it was about 10 months that I uh, worked with Justice Simpson. And that, that naturally led me to pursue a career in litigation. Um, so then I started work at DLA Piper, which um, for those who are old enough like me to remember was previously Phillips Fox. Um, 
And so this kind of leads into the discussion of pursuing an international career because kind of by coincidence or chance, Phillips Fox, while I was working there, was um, became part of DLA Piper, which of course is a big American law firm. So already on my resume, there is a name or a company that American employers could recognize. At the, you know, and I hadn't planned that. So I, I want to say that part of everything that happened to me is a bit of luck. Um, yeah, a little bit circumstantial, definitely. That's just so, yeah, really um, important. This, this is the next piece. So, <laughs> um, you know, I enjoyed working at Daily Piper. I had an amazing team. Um, it was the Commercial Disputes Resolution Group, which is essentially litigation. And that meant I was exposed to a broad range of litigation, a whole range of things from commercial contract disputes um, to marketing issues, IP issues. It wasn't just a narrow litigation group. Um, during that time, I started to look for in-house roles and I got my first in-house role at a company called iCorp. Again, for those who remember, um, that company existed. It was owned by Channel 10 or Network 10 um, and then was acquired and became out of home. Um, so they're an outdoor advertising agency, outdoor media company. So I really enjoyed that as my first in-house role. Um, and that was difficult to, to obtain for those people who are looking at firstly, how do you transition from a law firm to in-house? You know, I look back at that now that I've been in-house for, you know, over a decade, nearly, well, not two decades, over a decade, I look back in that and it, it was harder than I realised. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was a great in-house counsel. Hopefully my boss then begs to differ, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's really a challenging thing. So there's that leap and I won't even go into the whole back conversation of whether you need to be in a law firm before you go in-house. I don't think you do, but it definitely helps to get all that training. So I moved in-house for a year at iCorp before I found um, a role that I, I wanted that was more broader in scope. So at that role, I was looking at leases, I was looking at uh, advertising and, and what was being done for outdoor advertising in malls, in airports, billboards, those things. So I found a role at what was known as Hotel Club which was actually um, the Asia Pacific division of orbits.com, which is now um, probably better known as part of Expedia. So it's, okay. yeah, it, it fit a lot of my um, things <clears throat> I was interested in. So another thing I guess I've been guided by is always looking for industries or consumer products that I enjoy and I relate to. Um, mm. So I didn't, uh, as you can tell from this story, I hadn't yet really touched marketing and advertising law, which is what my expertise are now. So at that point, um, I was still looking to find which area of law do I want to focus on and do I want to specialize in? And that particular role meant that I was, again, working in an Australian office based in Sydney for an American company. So I was the only legal person based in Sydney and I had to cover all of APAC. And I was not even 30. So I was in my 20s with all that responsibility. And I highly recommend it to anyone because I wouldn't have done it any differently because it really was a sink or swim situation. I'm, I'm suddenly responsible for all these different countries. I was flying around to different parts of Asia and advising on different things, working. Um, and I was what you call a generalist, um, doing all different kinds of law. I had to advise on employment, on IP, on contracts. Um, on corporate filings and I had to I was forced to learn American laws and become familiar mm -hmm. with certain things because the legal team was actually based in Chicago where Orbit's headquarters was and I think so were, you, were you just on your own in this in the Sydney office doing that that yes. it was you just you yeah. okay uh, reporting was, into the US uh, yeah <laughs> I was the sole lawyer and I had um, my reporting structure was to someone in the US with a dotted line to the president of Hotel Club and he was based in Sydney. And that was a big learning experience oh. because the other, thing, the other thing that I was thrown into, which I didn't realise, was to be part of the SLT or what they call the senior leadership team. So for the first time, I am with C-suite people. I've got the chief marketing officer, the CMO there, the CTO, technology officer, the CFO, the chief finance officer, myself, um, as, and my actual title was senior counsel. It wasn't a chief legal officer um, and the um, president of the company. So we, we formed the SLT and it meant that we were reviewing and having meetings with all the other groups. But having that exposure 
to senior leadership people and understanding the strategy and the decision making was really invaluable. So I, I would I would consider that a big turning point and highlight in my career. And I'll fast forward because I'm I'm talking um, a long time about these things. So um, that role came to an end after a couple of years. Eventually, they decided to have the legal team consolidated. So my role actually became redundant, which was a very difficult process for me personally. Mm. Um, I think for anyone who has lost their job. Um, but what it also meant was that in the back of my mind, someday I wanted to move to New York. And so that someday became that day. Uh, pretty much very shortly after that happened, um, I applied to uh, complete the New York bar exam. I applied to do Barbary, which is the course to help you study for that. There's a whole number of courses that you can apply to study for any bar exam in America. So I did the Barbary course, which is essentially for those who are thinking about it or who know about it. It's a two month course and every single day they tell you what you're going to do. So that really helped me discipline myself when I was out of work and I had two full months to study for this. Um, I do have some friends who work full time and study for it, and that's extremely hard, but crazy advice because everything was hanging on that exam. So six months later, I fly to New York, get a ticket, take the exam, and then I come back and anxiously await the result, you know, a, a one or two months later. And I thought, if this doesn't work, I need to start looking for a job <laughs> um, in Sydney. So, you know, it was a really interesting time and and it came out that I did pass and pretty much after I found out I passed, within two weeks, I was out of here. And I, and so for those people who are thinking about doing that, I mean, I actually just flew to America and I didn't, I knew a handful of people in contacts having worked at those two companies um, and visited Chicago a lot when I was at um, Hotel Club and Orbitz. And, and I just started reaching out to networks and, and trying to set up phone meetings or in-person meetings with people just to talk about having a career internationally um, with that line of, I'm a lawyer from Sydney. I'm really interested in learning about your company, your industry. One of those casual, do you have five minute chats? Um, and so, so you didn't have a, a role lined up or anything. You, you decided that you were just going to go over there and then position yourself and start talking to people in the profession to see what opportunities were there. Exactly. So it was a calculated yeah. risk, yeah. It is. Um, yeah. A lot of people might say it's better to have something lined up. And, of course, in an ideal world, it is to have mm. a job that are lined up. And I had neither. I just right. knew that I wanted to get on the ground and start talking to people um, and see what happens. Um, and eventually, actually, a role did come out of that. And my first um, role based in New York after I passed the exam I actually didn't start till a year after I had finished my other job. So there is a gap in my resume of about a year, which I have to explain to people. And that was at MRY. It was an ad agency. So this is when I really started to hone my skills in marketing and advertising and IP law. So um, I worked with um, general counsel. It was just him and me, a team of two. Um, and MRY is an ad, ag ad agency owned by Publicis, um, which is a big international firm. Um, so that was great exposure, working with a whole range of brands. At the time, we had clients like Visa, Johnson & Johnson. They were big household names. And, you know, that was a really interesting time. And I realized how much I enjoyed working with creative people and creative teams to help them realize visions, um, being a fan of the arts myself. So, you know, that, that was really fun, reviewing a lot of ads, reviewing marketing copy, working on disclaimers, looking at video content. Um, and learning a lot about working with social media law, um, which is not something I studied back in the day at New South or, or Sydney. It wasn't really a topic, social media law. But really, at this agency, there was a strong focus on social, on working with influencers. And I really um, learned a lot about that then. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was looking again to broaden my scope. Um, and I've always kept an eye on things related to travel. So uh, an airline um, opportunity arose in JetBlue, which is um, essentially a domestic US carrier. They also fly to London now, Mexico and some Latin countries. But um, I started working at JetBlue as the sole marketing and advertising council there. Um, and I guess my, my interest led me there because again, it was travel and 
I, it was definitely one of the highlights of my career. Um, I'm just going to say free unlimited travel benefits. I think it was um, it was working with the biggest team, legal team that I had worked with today. So there were about 25, 30 lawyers. Um, there were specialists in all these different areas like litigation employment. So it was the first time I'd had that exposure. Yeah, and it works a lot on your own. Yeah, so you had a lot of like responsibility on your shoulders. So it probably would have been lovely to be part of a big team. Exactly. Actually, I hadn't mm. thought about it put it that way that yeah as I'm describing things I'd always been on my own or with one person yeah. a general counsel. yeah, yeah so you were often thrown into things yeah so you had to get up to speed very quickly exactly so mm. um I really enjoyed that role for a couple of years and of course loved living in New York City because that was mm. always my dream I always wanted to live in New York and then some four or so years later an opportunity came up at PlayStation um so I'm not admittedly a gamer um <laughs> but I have family who are but what I do love is interesting innovative law and in terms of advertising I think certain industries whether it's airlines or um, other ones who are more resource constrained uh, are not always doing the most dynamic advertising but a tech company is really forward in looking at things like AI VR AR all those things. So I just saw some opportunity to really push the boundaries on, on my knowledge and the next stage of law and tech. And that is obviously based in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. So I, I took a leap of faith. I was very reluctant to leave New York City. Um, and uh, so to work in-house there, I didn't need to do a bar exam because I'm not appearing before court. So I registered as in-house counsel and I started this role um, at PlayStation where I am now and it's been three or so years um, and now I'm the director of marketing and advertising law globally so I'm really enjoying that opportunity at the moment and and working with um, not only the team um, at PlayStation based in San Mateo but the global PlayStation team and part of the larger Sony Corp um, business in Japan so that's a long story. It is, but it's a it's a fascinating story, and there were like, like it was also a lot of kind of happenstance coming into it. But your experience lent itself um, to each kind of new position as well. So if you reflect now, do you think it would have made a difference if you went and started your overseas career earlier, or do you feel like having that? experience um, in Australia, in Sydney, where you got exposed to different areas in law, set you up and kind of maybe gave you a little bit more confidence as you progressed um, in a different country, different jurisdictions? Yeah, that is a great question. I think that having the experience helped. Um, and when I say having the experience, it's having the experience of working as a lawyer in a law firm and in-house. Because I know as a hiring manager now, and I've built out a team at PlayStation, it was non-existent before in terms of marketing. It was just me and my boss. I now have two direct reports and a team of six um, who work on marketing with me. So I know as a hiring manager, I look for that in people's resumes who apply, um, that they have solid experience. In so what, what type of skills would you look for in your role now, like in terms of then, um, the, the critical skills that perhaps um, lawyers or new lawyers need to be developing to actually position themselves for a, a career overseas. What are some of the kind of critical skills you think that are, are important that you would you would be looking at on CVs? Yeah, I'll answer that question in regards to my lens, which is more mm. an in-house perspective uh, than perhaps someone at a law firm or nonprofit. Um, yep. I think Problem solving is really important. Um, we have very novel problems and issues that arise with the marketing team here. They're, they're always wanting to do all kinds of innovative, creative things that often really do push the boundaries. And that's why I joined, you know, that's what I want, innovative marketing, you know, things that are new and different. And as you know, with all the technologies out there, there's ad tech, there is um, augmented reality things that are happening. Uh, there is a lot of areas that um, that cross into other areas. So the other thing I would look for is someone who has a general knowledge of a range of laws. So if your expertise are IP or marketing, 
I, I would want some interest or knowledge or experience in fields like data privacy, because that intersects with a lot of the things I deal with now. Um, I work very closely with product council, and that's a role that I didn't see when I was in Australia. It seems more tech forward, but they are council who work very closely on one particular product. So we have product council at PlayStation um, that focus on certain things and they closely align with the business. Mm -hmm. um, so I think adaptability in terms mm. of learning different things is really important. And then the thing that I think is most important is um, someone who can be a strategic partner to the business. So while we have our legal hats on, we are part of a legal business affairs team. Um, and we need to, we need to, we're asked to provide the legal advice, but sometimes we're also providing other advice with that hat on to sort of ask, you know, what are the different consequences about things? Have you considered negative PR could be an outcome? Have you considered all these other things? So it's, it's all of that. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's really, really useful. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, in terms of the, like kind of getting your head around all the different jurisdictions um, within the US and even going from New York City to San Francisco, was that something that you found difficult or was that something that you, you were able to get your head around fairly quickly? So it was something I could get my head around fairly quickly. There are different laws between the different states and they differ, I think, a lot more than between, say, New South Wales versus Victoria laws. They're really very different. Mm. Um, the area that I work in or focus on the most in terms of marketing and advertising, they're very different. Um, other areas are rights of publicity when we talk about, when people or brands talk about celebrities and things, they're very different. Um, auto renewal laws for subscription products, super different between New York and California. So certain areas are really different, but um, I think when, when you're working in any state, you have an awareness because a lot of advertising is nationwide within the US or it's global in any case. So even when I was working in New York, I was aware that California had stricter laws. So generally the, the MO would have been to apply the highest standards so that you will comply nationwide or international if possible around what you say. And they're all generally quite similar in my field of marketing, which is um, no misleading deceptive advertising, no false advertising. So it's it's a very similar concept and theory behind things that I look at and review. In in terms of like the maybe some of the challenges for you, because it sounds like um, you absolutely were able to kind of like master it. I don't know. It sounds like um, it it must have been like a a bit of a roller coaster at at times for you. Like what were some of the more more difficult and challenging times for you when you kind of did make that overseas move? Yeah, I, I guess the way I've talked about it, I've, I've talked about all the highlights and all the fun. Um, I, I would say it's definitely a lot of hard work and high stress. Uh, mm. they're, you know, the kind of roles I've had are very demanding and they do require you to work extremely hard on and off the clock. There is no real... Um, uh, you know, like private time versus work time. Like you can be contacted at any hour. I mean, not that most of the companies I've worked for, they don't, they don't require that. And there's no expectation of that. So for me, I've had to set certain boundaries for myself um, and not create expectations that I'm reachable 24 seven. But obviously the, the kind of roles I've had where you are the sole person or at least someone in a leadership role for a particular challenge. And if I have to cover for that, my team, um, I want to be the one to step in and say, people who report to me, they don't, they shouldn't be answering their phones on the weekend. This is up to me. I want to deal with this. So um, it's definitely a lot of hard work. And I think people need to prepare themselves for that. It, I mean, every every role I've had was extremely difficult to land in the first place as a as a foreigner, essentially, um, because you need to convince an American employer that you are the best person for the job, better than anyone in their yeah. country or um, who has gone to an Ivy League school or anything like that. It's, it's extremely hard to land the job. And once you land the job, that is not the end. That is the beginning. <laughs> then you need to prove yourself and work doubly hard to, um, to prove that you can be the trusted advisor and partner that they're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I could imagine. Um, just a, a couple of other questions about your your career to date because it is it is so fascinating. I was just going to ask you, in terms of um, plans 
from here or even just more general for people like yourself that have established a very successful career overseas, when it comes to coming back to their home country, how difficult is that, do you think, to make that transition, particularly where, um, you know, often you can come back and it can be more difficult to establish yourself in an equally kind of rewarding and um, and and successful career as well. So how do you think people will kind of manage that? And is that something that you've thought about if you were to ever return back to Australia? Yeah, at the moment, I'm still really enjoying my role um, and my life here. So I haven't given it a lot of thought. Um, I enjoy it so much that I, I see that for the next, you know, short to medium term for sure. Um, so I haven't given a lot of thought. Um, so I, I can't, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Yeah, question. no, that's okay. Well, it sounds like you've really, you know, very settled in the US and, and now that you're in San Francisco as well, it sounds like um, very exciting. In, in terms of some other, other questions around um, opportunities, say, in the US or anywhere else um, overseas, what would your advice be for people that are interested in travelling, particularly now that things are opening up a little bit? Mm. I go back to, I think, one of my early um, responses, which is around um, reaching out to people and trying to connect with them for five minutes or half an hour. You know, when I was really trying to build networks and explore opportunities um, here uh, before I landed a role, I, I remember going on LinkedIn and looking at all the, I listed out all the companies and, in, um, and industries I was interested in. And I had this crazy Excel sheet <laughs> with like literally 80 lines on it. And I put the name of the company, I looked up the name of the GC and the name of every lawyer in the legal team. And I either personally telephoned them or sent an email. And I got five responses to that 80. <laughs> five, out of eight. five out of 80. I, that's quite good. <laughs> so five people either wrote me back or picked up the phone, which, you know, so, I mean, expect to deal with a lot of rejection. Um, mm -hmm. People don't have mm -hmm. time here or, or anywhere, right? It's very difficult to cold call and it takes a lot of courage. Um, but that was something I did. And uh, out of those those five people, I did meet or talk to them, and I still remember exactly who they are. And I've sent them Christmas cards on occasion to say, "Do you remember me? I was that young Australian lawyer, and you gave me half an hour of your time." And and I've sent them a bottle of wine to say thank you because it's part of you know Lovely. my life. Yeah. It's really important to focus on building relationships at every stage of your life, um, and I feel like I've continued to do that, and it's it's really something mm. that I guess comes quite naturally to me because I'm quite extroverted but for those who aren't I think you know we used to talk about networking um, now it's really about building relationships inside and outside of the company um, and and having those genuine relationships I think make a big difference to to looking for yeah I think that's a really critical point about the um the genuineness of that and also the fact that you still keep in contact with those five people that you kind of remember how how, how they made you feel at that time because you are putting yourself a bit out there and, and it, as you say, um, it can be a bit of a roller coaster of emotions as well. But it's, it's, it's not personal, although sometimes it probably feels personal, I imagine, um, when, you, when you're having those conversations. Um, so just a, a couple of last questions before we finish up. Um, what advice would you give for your younger self? If you were to kind of think back and reflect, would you do things any differently? Or it sounds to me like, you know, it's it's all worked out beautifully. I mean, there's obviously been, been um, hiccups along the way, but overall... You've made it work and through that hard work and determination um, and endless, um, you know, improving your, your knowledge and your expertise and learning as well. There's obviously that theme. Yeah, yeah. And that's, the, I was going to touch on themes. Um, for me, it is continually seeking challenge and adventure. I put adventure in there because, you know, that that is part of my wanderlust travel um you know, passion, person speaking, but that applies a lot more broadly too. 
you know, adventure could be adventure professionally. And for me, that means I've worked in a lot of different legal areas. I went from litigation. My first job, actually, um, after, after I finished law school, I did have a short stint at Australian Business Lawyer. So I thought I wanted to be an employment lawyer for a time. So I've worked in that, in litigation, as a generalist, in marketing, in IP. So I've worked in different areas of law and I've traversed different industries as well as different continents. And if you're looking to, to mix up all those things, you have to be endlessly flexible and adaptable. And that's to the circumstances. And it's also having the ability, I think, to market yourself is really important. And I understand that better now than I ever have in terms of every day, how do I present to my team? How do I be an effective manager and leader? Like every single thing I do leads down to the team. How do I conduct myself professionally? Do I show up punctually on time? You know, then there's an expectation for others to show up punctually. I just, I'm a lot for more mindful and self-aware than I ever was at work. So there are things that I, I wish that maybe I knew earlier, the importance of those things, like how you are seen to be aware of that and how you can project, you know, your culture and your voice um, to others in your team. So do you, do you think that's also part of the area of work that you're in, that there, there is that, um, the, the whole social media, that side of things too? Do you think that that has maybe shape that or do you think it's just something that is always important as as a lawyer or really in any profession is that ability to always present yourself in the best light and and you know if you if you do muck up it it stays with you yeah it's a good question I think it relates to any industry Um, yeah I member of at PlayStation we have women at PlayStation which is um, an e-net or an employee network Um, And I talk with the, I I like to talk with young women or interns and be on panels and give advice like this to encourage and inspire. I think, I think it can really be across any industry or any um, spectrum. Um, But I understand your question because having worked in marketing, I also understand the importance of Mm. what it means to have a brand. And that can be a personal brand for us. Um, You know, what is your elevator pitch? Mm. Right? Do you have a five-minute summary? If you were trapped in an elevator with someone and it's an employer or potential employer, like one day you want to work at this company, how would you sell yourself? Uh, so there are things I think about a lot. And, you know, I guess because I've worked so much on social media and advised on that, I'm more comfortable with it. So I do use that tool. So everyone can find me on LinkedIn um, or other places. Um, but I, I do think that's important. Yeah, I think that that. It brings us to a, a conclusion. Um, I feel like there, we could probably talk endlessly about your career as it is so fascinating and I'm sure that there'll be um, a lot of people who will have more questions. Um, but I just wanted to say a big thank you for making yourself available and just for all the, the, the insights and perspective that you've been able to, to share with me today. Um, I think that it will be just terrific for people to hear that firsthand from someone like yourself who does um, seem to be kind of living a a dream career, Um, but it really highlights all that you've put into into where you are now. It sounds like it has not been an an easy path, Um, but it sounds like, you know, you're, you're really enjoying what you're doing now and where you're living. So that's just a lovely, lovely kind of story. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm happy to answer other questions if there are any that come up. All right. Thank you for that. Um, um, I'm now just going to um, just finish the today and we'll speak another time. Thank you. All right. Thank you.